Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining in on this uh, library open house, this library talk. We call it a library open house or a library talk because it's um, presented by the Holy Faith Library Committee. And normally we would be in the library itself uh, to help showcase the resources of our wonderful uh, parish library. But given the pandemic and COVID-19, we're unable to be gather in person in our, in our space. Um, and for something like this, with a presentation um, that would inquire um, audio visual, we probably wouldn't have been in the library anyway. Uh, we would have been in Palin Hall, the parish hall, to, uh, to accommodate uh, the screen and, uh, and uh, the PowerPoint presentation. As some of you may know, this is the second um, opportunity to uh, hear uh, Kent and uh, his presentation on uh, the pilgrimage to the Holy Land in the footsteps of Jesus. The first one was um, well subscribed, but we didn't record it. And so this time, by popular demand, we've invited him back. Um, people were sorry that they missed the first one. and. Uh, and others are saying, oh, I'd love to come, but as long as you're going to record it, we will uh, um, be able to join in um, at some point in the future. So welcome everyone who is joining in to this um, library talk. As I said, it's a, um, it's a back by popular demand uh, because of the word that got out of how interesting and engaging uh, Kent's presentation was the uh, the first time around, not only from um, just being engaged in terms of the whole landscape of the Holy Land and the geography, um, but also because of the whole concept of pilgrimage and what it means to be a pilgrim. So it's a it's a very rich presentation on on many levels, and we are indebted for to Kent for coming and um, doing this presentation again. If you don't know, um, Kent has prepared a wonderful book of photographs of the pilgrimage that he took with Christ Church Cathedral in Houston a couple of years ago, and that has given that book to the library, to the Holy Faith Library, mm -hmm. where it is available. Even if the facilities are closed, if you would like to come in and uh, um, and use any of the resources. We are allowing people to do that sort of one at a time with uh, advance notice so that we can let you in the building. And I would um, very much encourage you to take a look at uh, the book that Kent has prepared um, as a uh, commentary on the pilgrimage. The way we're gonna proceed is we'll, I'll turn it over to Kent in just a second. Um, and we thought it would be best to take questions at the very end of the presentation so it doesn't break up the flow of, uh, of Kent's narrative. Um, if you have a question and would like to put it in the chat room, you're welcome to do so any, at any time while it's fresh in your mind. And at the end of the presentation, I'll go back through and, and, uh, and read off all the, the questions and give Kent an opportunity to answer. Um, and then um, obviously for Emma and Jim who are on the phone, you're not gonna be able to do the chat <laughs> or, but I'll certainly uh, give you the questions so that you'll know what, uh, what some of the questions were and give Ken an opportunity to answer. But then we'll also just open it up for general discussion as well if anyone has questions at the, uh, um, at the end of the presentation by Kent. So um, again, welcome everyone, glad you're joining in. And uh, Kent, it, the floor is yours. Okay, can, uh, before we uh, go into screen mode, can everybody hear me? And is the, you can, okay, good. All right, so bear with me. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, in the next 50 minutes or so, I'll try to convey impressions 
from a Holy Land pilgrimage that my wife Kaki and I made in September of 2018. The pilgrimage was one of many offered by St. George's College, the Anglican Center for Education, Hospitality, Pilgrimage and Reconciliation, located in East Jerusalem. Our particular excursion titled Footsteps of Jesus focused on the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, but St. George's offers programs on a range of topics. And while we traveled to Israel with a group from our previous church home, Christ Church Cathedral in Houston, there were also pilgrims from Australia and New Zealand who joined our St. George's company. So anyone can sign up for a program at St. George's, whether or not you're part of a larger group. And they do an absolutely outstanding job of organizing and leading these wonderful experiences. And I'll speak a little bit more about them at the end of my talk. Now, in preparing for this presentation, uh, I was faced with the challenge of what to focus on given the limited amount of time we have today. Kaki and I spent nearly two weeks in Israel, both on pilgrimage and on our own. And it's hard to compress our experience into a brief talk. So I decided to focus on two things that particularly struck me, pilgrims and places. This is necessarily a subjective choice, and many were the locations that we visited have ended up on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Further, I'm not trying to provide today a precise chronological synopsis of Jesus's life on earth or a complete one. As all of you know, the Gospels themselves are sometimes inconsistent with respect to certain details, and as you'll come to understand, trying to follow Jesus' life chronologically would have us moving like pinballs around the Holy Land. Therefore, I thought it would be less disorienting to organize today's talk geographically. Nonetheless, I think you'll find that my outline follows a broad, if not exact, progression of the life of Jesus Christ. So let's begin with a simple question. What is a pilgrimage exactly? One internet definition is, quote, a journey, especially a long one, made to some sacred place as an act of religious devotion, unquote. The annual pilgrimage walk to Chimayo during Holy Week would be a familiar local example that fits this definition. But in my view, it's more than just a trip to a sacred destination. It requires preparation beforehand, intentional action as you progress, and reflection afterward. In many ways, it's an inward journey as well as a physical one. The very Reverend Richard Sewell, Dean of St. George's College, describes a pilgrimage to the Holy Land as an encounter, an encounter with your fellow pilgrims, with the land and the holy sites it contains, with the people who live there, and of course, with Jesus Christ. And I would add, not just the divine Jesus, the one that speaks to us from the Gospels, but the human Jesus, the one who felt mortal emotions, who got hungry and tired and sometimes cranky, who walked these very roads. And one of the things that affected me most profoundly during our pilgrimage was the encounter we had with other Christian pilgrims from around the world especially the many pilgrims from different Christian faith traditions, such as Coptic or Greek Orthodox, who sometimes express their devotion in different ways, but with whom we were nonetheless sharing a common spiritual experience. Witnessing their fervor, like these two Ethiopian pilgrims praying beside the Jordan River, enriched my own faith journey. And why did place matter to me? Even though many of the place names we visited were familiar from the Bible, I found that I didn't really understand their geography or their physical relationship with each other. Seeing the actual physical settings made the stories more real, more relevant, more complete. And several locations truly surprised me in one way or another. Father James Martin, in his book, Jesus, a Pilgrimage, puts it like this, quote, Traveling through the Holy Land is like visiting the family foam of a good friend. No matter how well you know the person, you'll understand your friend better afterward. During our pilgrimage, we joked about whether Jesus stood on this rock or that rock, 
And believe me, there are lots of rocks in the Holy Land. And though some biblical locations have been confirmed with archaeological excavations or other hard data, it is true that many sites are celebrated based on tradition. That is, a reverence for a particular hilltop or spring or town based on customs that in many cases go back to the third or fourth centuries. But I found that sometimes the precision of a location didn't matter as much as the essence of a location. I don't know whether Jesus walked through this particular wadi when following his baptism, he entered the wilderness in Matthew 4. But when I stood on that ridgetop and beheld the desolation of the Judean desert in front of me, I got it. So let's begin with a brief geographical orientation. And as we work our way through the Holy Land, I'll try to describe the places that I found particularly meaningful and the pilgrims that we encountered there. This is a satellite image of the region with the Mediterranean off to the left. And probably the two most recognizable features inland are the Sea of Galilee, the large freshwater lake with the blue arrow toward the top, and the ultra-saline Dead Sea directly to its south with the magenta arrow. The Jordan River and its valley connect the two. Though not nearly as visible from space, Jerusalem, labeled 8, is located in the hills to the southwest of the Jordan Valley. Nearly everything we'll be talking about today is located near one of these major landmarks. For geological reasons that I won't go into, and believe me, that takes some serious self-control since I'm a geologist by training, Jerusalem sits more than 3,000 feet above the lower valley and the Dead Sea. So, going from Jericho in the lower valley up to Jerusalem, a distance of less than 20 miles, is almost exactly the same distance and elevation change as going from the plaza in downtown Santa Fe up to the base of the ski mountain above town. Now, as a geologist, I knew that the Dead Sea lies more than a thousand feet below sea level. It's one of the world's great geological oddities. But I had never really considered the physical relationship between the Dead Sea, the Jordan Valley, and Jerusalem, and how that drastic change in elevation in such a short distance might play out in scripture. That came as something of a revelation to me. We're going to begin our journey in the north in Galilee and work our way south. Galilee is hilly and rocky and yet still contains much fertile agricultural land. And in the Bible, it's associated with the Annunciation, Jesus's early life, his ministry, and ultimately his resurrection. So it covers the full range of his time on earth. And we'll begin at Nazareth, labeled 14 on the map, just to the southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Today, Nazareth is the largest Arab city in Israel, and its population is about 75,000, roughly equal to Santa Fe's. About 25% of its population is Christian, and its skyline is dominated by the enormous mid-20th century Basilica of the Annunciation, built by the Franciscans above the grotto where, in Luke 1, the angel Gabriel announces to Mary that she has been chosen to conceive Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Here, pilgrims filed solemnly by that fabled grotto in quiet contemplation. But Luke doesn't actually say where exactly Gabriel appeared to Mary. And in the Greek Orthodox tradition, the Annunciation occurs while Mary is fetching water at a spring. And the more modest Orthodox Church of the Annunciation is built above that location. Here, Orthodox pilgrims line up to fill their two-liter water bottles from that holy but sluggish spring, and they occasionally broke up the waiting by bursting into spontaneous hymns. In either case, whether in a grotto or at a spring, Mary's affirmative response, Here am I, the servant of the Lord, changed history. 
In Jesus' day, Nazareth was home to no more than about 400 inhabitants, a true backwater even in Roman times. In fact, Nazareth was so insignificant that it's not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. Practically nothing is known of Jesus' early life, either from archaeology or from Scripture, but an interesting site that we visited may offer some clues. It was an excavation underneath the Sisters of Nazareth convent, which revealed a complex of ruins, many dating from Jesus' time. Here, for example, is a rock-hewn tomb of the type commonly used in the first century, complete with its ceiling stone. But the star attraction was a stone house said to belong to Joseph, meaning that this may have been the childhood home of Jesus. Now, whether or not this is literally true, it nonetheless gives us a glimpse of what first century life in Nazareth was like. The courtyard house shown here is partly hewn from outcropping limestone and is partly constructed of stone cobbles. Most likely there would have been several small houses clustered around a common courtyard where families would have cooked their meals and tended their animals. There would have been little privacy, but a strong sense of community. And as archaeologist Jody Magnus comments, to modern sensibilities, living conditions were likely to have been, quote, filthy, malodorous, and unhealthy, unquote. <clears throat> As carpenters or woodworkers, Joseph and Jesus would have performed some tasks involving specialized skill, but also work just requiring hard physical labor, like cutting and hewing trees and hauling the lumber, all the while lugging their tools across the countryside. We tend to think of carpenters today and imagine craftsmen in aprons turning out furniture or cabinets from a shop where the tools neatly line the walls. But in those days, they would have produced crude furniture, yes, but also splintery roof beams and door lintels and perhaps a well-crafted oxen yoke. And as woodworkers plying their trade in a backwater on the fringes of the Roman Empire, their status would likely have been near the bottom of the regional economic ladder. What impact might this upbringing have had on Jesus' subsequent teachings? As a result of his early life experiences, we can imagine, as Father James Martin speculates, that among other things, Jesus understood deeply the physical and emotional realities of human life the importance of family and community, the demands of physical work, and the ordeal of those living on the margins of society. In contrast, the settlements along the Sea of Galilee, some 20 miles distant from Nazareth, must have seemed downright cosmopolitan in comparison. Ancient writers tell us that the sea supported bustling towns with a robust fishing industry providing livelihoods for many. Even more importantly, the Via Maris, a major trade route connecting Egypt with Syria, passed along the sea's northern shore, bringing commerce and foreign visitors. And the sea stood at the intersection between Jewish villages to the west and the Hellenized world to the east. So it was kind of a, a crossroads where different cultures mingled. Matthew chapter 4 informs us that Capernaum, a fishing village on the northern shore of the sea, became something of an adopted hometown for Jesus as he launched his ministry. At that time, Capernaum was home to about a thousand or so people and possibly a Roman garrison. Not a metropolis, perhaps, but a step up from Nazareth. It was here that he famously recruited the fishermen Simon Peter and his brother Andrew to become, quote, fishers of men. Father James Martin notes, as the angel asked Mary at the Annunciation, Jesus asked the disciples to assent to something mysterious. And quite incredibly, when you stop to consider it, they do assent, leaving behind parents, families, obligations, and everything familiar. 
Today, the ruins of ancient Capernaum are well displayed, showing the foundations of courtyard homes and other buildings made from local basalt with the Sea of Galilee shimmering nearby. There is one particular house that is said to have belonged to Peter and which has been revered as such since the first century. Mary Magdalene is believed to have come from the town of Magdala, located along the shoreline between Capernaum and Nazareth. Only 10 years ago, archaeologists discovered the remains of a first century synagogue, one of only seven from this period known in the entire world. Jesus certainly passed through Magdala during his Galilean ministries, and it seems very likely that he would have taught in this synagogue. Among the most beloved passages in the Gospels is the Beatitudes, the opening stanzas of the Sermon on the Mount, at least in Matthew's telling. Luke places the event in, quote, a level place. Sticking with Matthew, there is a hilltop on the sea's northern shore near Capernaum that's been venerated as the site of the sermon for more than a millennium. We cannot know, of course, whether this was the precise site, but the view of the sea is sublime and the sense of peace is unmistakable, entirely compatible with the lyricism of Matthew's prose. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. These profound, even radical proclamations are as beautiful and as challenging today as they must have been then. There were a few places on the pilgrimage where you could gaze out and imagine that you were seeing what Jesus saw, a view that was relatively unchanged for 2,000 years. Looking out at the Sea of Galilee from the Mount of Beatitudes was one of those places. Let's move south from Galilee into the Jordan River Valley. The Jordan flows from the Sea of Galilee into the Dead Sea only 150 miles to the south, but its modest length belies its prominence in biblical lore. And as you travel further south from Galilee into increasingly arid land, the Jordan's importance as a source of fresh water cannot be overstated. No doubt the demands of a growing population and agricultural irrigation have reduced the river's flow in recent decades, but it's never been a grand river on the scale of the Nile or even the Rio Grande. A young Theodore Roosevelt who toured the Holy Land with his parents in the 1870s commented in his diary that the Jordan was, quote, what we should call a small creek in America. Of course, Christians most associate the Jordan River with the baptism of Jesus. All four Gospels refer to this event in one way or another. Yet there's a question that theologians have wrestled with for a long time. If Jesus was free of original sin, then why did he need to be baptized? In Matthew's account, John the Baptist seems to be asking as much as he tries to talk Jesus out of it. And Jesus' reply, to fulfill all righteousness, is, to me anyway, vague and unsatisfying. Many have offered various explanations, but the one that resonates with me is that Jesus did so as an act of solidarity with us sinful humans. He was, through this simple act, demonstrating his humanness by getting in line and being baptized. For many pilgrims, a baptismal reenactment in the Jordan is a highlight of their pilgrimage. During our visit, each of us waded into the river and received a blessing, as shown here. But other pilgrims go a step further, quite literally. Here, a group from Eastern Europe fully immerse themselves in the blessed, if murky, waters. Now, just before the Jordan empties into the Dead Sea, you come to the oasis city of Jericho, probably one of the most familiar of all biblical place names. 
It's mentioned numerous times in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and for good reason. As a freshwater sanctuary in an otherwise arid land, it's been occupied for 10,000 years or more, making it arguably the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. Now, just let that thought sink in for a minute. Luke 19 describes how Jesus, upon entering Jericho on his final trip to Jerusalem, spies Zacchaeus in a sycamore tree. A rich but despised tax collector, Zacchaeus had climbed the tree, quote, because he wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. Jesus then invites himself to dine with the unpopular Zacchaeus, another instance of Jesus embracing the unloved. There is an ancient and venerated sycamore tree in Jericho, shown here, that is said to be more than 2,000 years old. Is this the Zacchaeus tree? Perhaps, but I think probably not. Like other locations in the Holy Land, I suspect that here tradition trumps authenticity. But the real revelation to me in Jericho was its longevity and its importance in antiquity as a travel hub. And once you see the region for yourself, it's easy to see why. The relatively flat Jordan Valley extending from hilly Galilee to Jericho provided a natural north-south travel corridor with ready access to fresh water. It was a crucial part of the regional travel network. Who knows how many times Jesus passed through Jericho after all, Luke 2 tells us that every year Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, on one occasion famously leaving Jesus behind in the temple when he was 12 years old. And even earlier, perhaps Joseph and Mary passed through Jericho in the Luke birth narrative. So Jericho was essential to anyone traveling in the region in the first century. And seeing its physical relationship with the other Holy Land sites put everything into perspective for me. And I wish we had spent a little more time here. As you move further down the Jordan Valley, the landscape becomes noticeably more arid. The area shown in yellow is known as the Judean wilderness, but in fact, it's just the beginning of a vast desert environment that continues southward for more than a thousand miles through Israel, Jordan, and the Arabian Peninsula. And this wilderness is truly barren and fearsome, a fitting place for the temptation of Jesus after his baptism as described in Matthew 4. Here you can see the remarkable St. George's Monastery, no relation to St. George's College, nestled in the canyon wall of Wadi Kelt. Though the current monastery structure dates from the late 19th century, the monastic tradition at this location goes back to the Byzantine period. Wadi Kelt, as you can see, is a major canyon cutting through the wilderness. It begins near Jerusalem and descends northeastward, emptying into the Jordan Valley near Jericho. And as a result, it served as the main transportation route between Jerusalem and Jericho for thousands of years. For example, in 2 Samuel, David used this route to flee Jerusalem after his son Absalom has made himself king. And in 70 CE, the 10th Roman legion marched up the Wadi to destroy Jerusalem after the Jewish revolt. Jesus surely traveled this route during his multiple visits to Jerusalem in John and Luke, including his final ascent before Palm Sunday. But the route between Jericho and Jerusalem through Wadi Kilt was notoriously difficult and dangerous. Some scholars have even suggested that it was the inspiration for the infamous Valley of the Shadow of Death in the 23rd Psalm. Not surprisingly, people tended to travel through the Wadi in groups for safety, and they departed for their destination in the wee hours so that they would not be caught in the wilderness after sunset. It's appropriate then that Jesus uses this location for the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. You may recall that Jesus tells how, quote, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers, unquote. 
Firstly, the expression going down to Jericho is not just a figure of speech. As we've seen, Jericho sits more than 3,000 feet below Jerusalem. But more importantly, this was one of those instances where the sense of place made the story come alive for me. You can just imagine a lone traveler making his way down a road like this in the wilderness through the valley of the shadow of death, not knowing what danger may lurk around the corner. The sense of isolation and vulnerability is utterly palpable, making the compassion of the Good Samaritan all the more moving. And so we finally climbed those 3,000 feet from the Jordan Valley through the Judean wilderness and reached Jerusalem, shown here by the blue circle. You leave the dust and desolation of the wilderness behind and enter a verdant and hilly city with a much cooler and a much wetter climate. Jerusalem definitely needs some orientation to get a sense of how the major sites relate to each other. And we'll start with the Mount of Olives on the city's eastern approaches, which is across the rather steep Kidron Valley from the Temple Mount and Jerusalem. As you approach the Mount of Olives summit from the wilderness side, which is in this image is just off the slide to the right, you reach Bethany, where Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. And when you top the Mount of Olives, you get the most marvelous view of Jerusalem across the valley, as Jesus did on Palm Sunday. The Mount of Olives is also the location of the Garden of Gethsemane, which is further down the slope near the valley floor. On this satellite image, you can also discern the outline of today's old city, which is enclosed by its 16th century city walls highlighted here in red. It's important to realize that Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt many times during its history, and while the Temple Mount has remained in place, in many cases, the city walls have moved over the centuries, and this will come into play when we talk about Golgotha in a few minutes. Today, there are seven active gates leading into the old city, the Damascus Gate, the Jaffa Gate, and others that you may have heard of. Here, several groups of pilgrims proceed down the Mount of Olives, as Jesus did on Palm Sunday, with a wonderful view of the Temple Mount in front of them. From here, Jesus entered Jerusalem in triumph. This photo provides a clearer view of the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. The Temple Mount is an enormous raised platform that once housed Solomon's Temple and later the Second Temple, which was standing in Jesus' day. The golden dome structure you see prominently on the Temple Mount today is the 7th century Dome of the Rock, an Islamic shrine covering the outcrop where, according to tradition, Abraham prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac. The second temple, of course, stood on the Temple Mount, but just to be clear, they are not the same thing. The mount is a vast area surrounded by walls covering about 36 acres, something like 27 American football fields. As big and impressive as the Second Temple must have been, it was dwarfed by the huge pedestrian plaza surrounding it, much as the Dome of the Rock is today. In the foreground, you can also see the huge Jewish necropolis that covers a large portion of the Mount of Olives. There was a necropolis here in Jesus' day too, as well as another burial ground across the valley and adjacent to the eastern wall of the Temple Mount. That's the wall that's facing us in this photo. And I want you to keep these in mind when we talk about the events of Maundy Thursday. So I now want to focus on the southern end of the Temple Mount. So let's zoom into this area shown by the red arrow. Mark 11 tells us that after triumphantly entering the city on Palm Sunday, the next day Jesus, quote, entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts, unquote. 
This was during Passover, and the Temple Mount would have been jam-packed with pilgrims. And just to give you a sense of scale, the Jewish Roman historian Josephus estimated that Jerusalem's Passover festival in the year 66 CE, about 30 years later, attracted an astonishing 2.7 million pilgrims who sacrificed a quarter of a million lambs. Now, perhaps Josephus was exaggerating, but you get the idea. Lining the interior parapet walls, shown here by the blue arrows, there would have been a series of arcades containing stalls where sacrificial birds and livestock were available for purchase. But you needed to have the local Jewish currency in order to do so, hence the need for money changers. The shoving of the crowds, the sights and smells of burnt offerings, the bleeding of thousands of animals awaiting their fate, it all must have been incredibly overpowering. Excavations during the 1960s revealed that the first century entrance to the Temple Mount was through this massive southern wall built by King Herod. In this picture, you can make out several flights of stairs leading to the wall highlighted in red, but the entrance has long since been walled off. Nonetheless, it's very likely that Jesus would have entered the Temple Mount via these stairways through the now blocked entrance arches, then up further stairs inside the temple complex to the level of the plaza where he began to drive out the money changers. By the way, that building with the gray dome is the El Aqsa Mosque, considered to be the third holiest site in Islam. Needless to say, it attracts its own pilgrims. Now let's move over to Mount Zion, just outside the present day city walls. Mount Zion is believed to be the location of the Last Supper, as well as the palace of the high priest Caiaphas. Today, there's a Crusader era building called the Senecal commemorating the location of the Last Supper. But what I want you to notice is that after the Last Supper, Jesus would have made his way over to the Garden of Gethsemane at the base of the Mount of Olives, passing under the southern and eastern walls of the Temple Mount. Remember that I mentioned that the eastern wall of the Temple Mount is bordered by a burial ground in use during Jesus' day, and there was also the necropolis on the Mount of Olives facing him, both shaded in yellow on this slide. So Jesus would have passed between these graveyards on his way to pray in the garden with the, quote, tombs shining in the moonlight, unquote, as Father James Martin evocatively puts it foreshadowing his own impending death. There seems to be general agreement among biblical scholars that the place celebrated today as the Garden of Gethsemane is accurately located. John 18 tells us that after the Last Supper, Jesus, quote, went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered, unquote. Luke says that they went to the Mount of Olives, while Matthew and Mark mention Gethsemane specifically by name. Gethsemane means oil press in both Hebrew and Aramaic, and indeed the garden, or what remains of it today as it's quite compact, is really more of an olive grove with a dozen or so trees that are centuries old. And here, pilgrims throw themselves on a rock to pray in the garden, much as Jesus did. In Matthew 26, Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and is taken to the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, which was back on Mount Zion. This is a view from the traditional location of that palace, looking toward the Temple Mount. And the stone steps shaded in yellow in the foreground date from Jesus' day and lead from Mount Zion to the Kidron Valley. From, and from there, you can go on to the Mount of Olives. Thus, Jesus may have walked down these very stairs going to the garden after the Last Supper and coming back after his arrest. And it was here at the palace of Caiaphas that Peter denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed, 
as all four Gospels attest. Now, all of the Gospels record the trial of Jesus by Pontius Pilate, but only John mentions a specific location where the trial took place, Pilate's praetorium, essentially his headquarters. But where was this? Traditionally, the praetorium was believed to be at the Antonia Fortress uh, military garrison, named for Mark Antony, on the north side of the Temple Mount. After all, it housed Roman soldiers, and it had a commanding view over the temple complex and was therefore strategically located. This location is shown on the map by the purple dot. But Pontius Pilate normally resided in Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast, and he was only in Jerusalem during Passover as a show of Roman authority. Josephus, the historian, tells us that Roman governors stayed at Herod's palace when in Jerusalem, which by this time was occupied by his son and successor, Herod Antipas. Archaeologists believe that Herod's palace was located north of Mount Zion, shown by the second purple dot. And the consensus of modern scholars is that this is where the trial took place. Now, the reason that this is important, and not just an academic curiosity, is that the location of Jesus's trial determines his ultimate journey to Golgotha and his crucifixion, the Via Dolorosa, with the Stations of the Cross. Did he carry his cross from the first dot or the second? Franciscan monks in the Middle Ages established the tradition of the Via Dolorosa beginning near the Temple Mount, the first dot, and leading to Golgotha from there. And that pathway is still used today by pilgrims, even though historically it may be the wrong route. Then again, perhaps this doesn't really matter. Maybe this is another one of those cases of whether Jesus stood on this rock or that rock. What really matters is that we as pilgrims make that trip spiritually with Jesus. Most Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land walk the Via Dolorosa as an intentional act of pilgrimage, and we were no exception. Here with our cross, we make our way through the old city early in the morning to avoid everyday foot traffic, stopping at each station for prayer and reflection. And the ultimate destination is, of course, Golgotha, the place of the skull shown here by the red dot. It's important to realize that at the time of the crucifixion, this location stood outside the city walls of Jerusalem because all executions and all burials took place outside the city walls. But as you can see from this image, Golgotha today is well within the 16th century city walls of the old city. After the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea requested Jesus' body from Pilate, according to all four Gospels, and buried him in a nearby rock-hewn tomb. And when I say nearby, I mean virtually adjacent, because the Roman Emperor Constantine built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre over both Golgotha and the tomb in the 4th century, based on the memory and tradition of the Christian community then present in Jerusalem. Constantine's church was both destroyed and rebuilt in the 11th century, and it's been enlarged and modified since then. Like the Garden of Gethsemane, there seems to be general agreement that the location of Golgotha and the tomb are accurate, even though there is a competing Golgotha site just north of the Damascus Gate. Holy Sepulchre is a massive structure, and yet in the jumble of the very dense old city, it would be easy to pass its entrance by. It doesn't stand apart in a grand setting like St. Peter's in Rome or a Gothic cathedral in France. It's only upon entering that you grasp its enormity, and at first, to be honest, it's a little overwhelming. This photo shows the great rotunda rising above a smaller chapel known as the Aedicule, which itself is built above the tomb. You can just see the tower of the Aedicule rising here in the foreground. 
and here under the stern gazes of Greek Orthodox priests, pilgrims quietly line up to enter the tomb chamber. At the time of the crucifixion, Golgotha was, in fact, an abandoned stone quarry, which may help explain the ready access to an adjacent rock-hewn tomb. And to reach the very elaborate Greek Orthodox altar that marks the Golgotha site, you climb a flight of stairs inside Holy Sepulchre as you are literally climbing the hill of Calvary. And although you do line up and file past the altar, there is plenty of surrounding space to linger and to soak it all in. Here, a South Asian pilgrim raises her arms in prayer in front of that altar. And pilgrims are allowed to reach through a hole in the floor underneath the altar and touch the walk beneath. And looking in the background, a member of our pilgrimage group is doing just that. Other acts of devotion were also evident at Holy Sepulchre. Here, pilgrims venerate the Stone of Unction, which commemorates the site where Jesus' body was prepared for burial. The actual stone here dates from the 19th century, but that certainly doesn't matter to these pilgrims. You can see several, several of them kissing the stone, while another caresses it with a cloth. Still others place candle on the stone hoping to capture a trace of its essence. It wasn't until I got home and looked at this photo again that I contemplated the fact that all of the pilgrims pictured here are women. In the Gospels, it's Joseph of Arimathea who prepares Jesus's body for burial with the help of Nicodemus and John. But of course, Mary Magdalene and other women were there and watched it all happen. And it was this same group of women, the male disciples were nowhere to be seen, who returned on the third day to anoint the body with spices and ointments, only to find the tomb empty. Maybe it was just a coincidence that there were only women at the Stone of Unction that the, on the day that we visited. But if you search for images of the stone on the internet, there's a heavy preponderance of women performing these acts of veneration calling, recalling for me anyway, the women who followed Jesus down from Galilee, Mary Magdalene chief among them, and who proclaimed to the disciples that Christ was risen. In Luke 24, we're told that after the crucifixion, the resurrected Jesus appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, only a few miles from Jerusalem. The disciples did not recognize him on the road, but later over supper, Jesus made his presence known to them as they broke bread, and then he vanished. Crusaders considered the village known today as Abu Ghash to be the biblical Emmaus, and they built the Church of the Resurrection in the 12th century to commemorate Jesus's appearance. Today, it is one of the finest Crusader era structures in all of Israel, and in particular, the original frescoes, though deteriorating, are just beautiful. On our pilgrimage, we were very privileged to celebrate Eucharist by ourselves in this fabulous setting. As the final stop on our journey today, I want to return to Galilee as the resurrected Jesus did, and according to John, as did the disciples Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and others. One wonders why, after the tumultuous ministry of Jesus Christ for the previous three years, these disciples had returned so quickly to their previous homes and livelihoods, but apparently they did. Perhaps after the trauma of the crucifixion, they looked backward rather than forward. John 21 relates the story of Jesus appearing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee to Simon Peter and the others who were returning from an unsuccessful night of fishing. After Jesus causes their nets to be filled with more fish than they can manage, 153 fish to be exact, they recognize him. 
Peter in particular is so excited to see Jesus that he throws himself into the water and swims to the beach. Not unlike, I suppose, the ecstatic Forrest Gump when he sees Lieutenant Dan on the pier to borrow an image from popular culture. At least in this case, the other disciples were there to bring in the boat and the catch to shore. Jesus already has breakfast cooking over a fire. And after they've all eaten, Jesus asked Peter, do you truly love me more than these? In fact, Jesus asked Peter the same question three times, recalling Peter's three denials at the palace of Caiaphas. And each time Peter answers yes. Without saying so directly, Jesus is forgiving Peter, thereby restoring him spiritually, and he commands him to feed my sheep, in essence, launching the mission of his church. It's a moving narrative of love and reconciliation, of compassion and redemption. The Church of the Primacy of St. Peter in Tabga commemorates this passage in John. Like so many other locations in the Holy Land, the 20th century church is built atop of the remains of a previous chapel, in this case, dating from the 4th century, indicating a long-standing reverence for this location. By the 9th century, the church was known as the Place of the Coals, in reference to the fire that Jesus built. And standing there on that rocky beach, you can almost sense the crackle of the fire, the aroma of roasting fish, and imagine that you are sharing the same view with Jesus and the disciples from that morning long ago. As I said at the beginning, in creating this abbreviated version of our pilgrimage to the Holy Land, I had to leave some wonderful locations on the cutting room floor. I didn't talk about the old city of Jerusalem as it exists today with its 16th century walls, for example. Something like 40,000 souls live in an area of less than one square mile, divided into the Muslim, Jewish, Christian, and Armenian quarters. I consider Jerusalem to be one of the great cities of the world, and to wander through the narrow passageways of the old city was one of my life's great experiences. Perhaps the most amazing sight visually in all of Israel is Masada, Herod's mountaintop retreat overlooking the Dead Sea. Here, according to the historian Josephus, a thousand refugees from the Jewish revolt in 70 CE committed mass suicide rather than to surrender to the 10th Roman legion laying siege to them. It's just jaw-dropping. Then there's Bethlehem, where Jesus' birth site is commemorated by a church dating from Constantine's time, making it the oldest site continually used for worship in all of Christendom. The city of David, just south of today's old city, is where Jerusalem first emerged as a settlement sustained by a nearby spring. Here, Israeli archaeologists believe they found the remains of King David's palace. Qumran is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and the ruins of the town itself are impressive in their own right, and some of the original scrolls are on display in Jerusalem. Yad Vashem is Israel's Holocaust memorial spread over a sprawling campus. It's architecturally striking, and as you would expect, it's quite moving. And while I've mentioned several locations that are actually located in the West Bank, Bethany, Jericho, and the Jordan Valley, for example, I didn't speak to the present day reality of Arab life, including Christians in this occupied territory. The extraordinary Hafrata wall erected by Israel to separate Jerusalem from the West Bank is a focus of protest on the Palestinian side as shown by the graffiti here. We often forget that the population of Bethlehem in the West Bank is about 15% Christian, and they're subjected to the same extreme security measures as our Arab Muslims. 
and while you're in the region, it's not too difficult to organize an excursion into Jordan, where the spectacular ruins at Petra await. Any pilgrimage to the Holy Land should consider these items in the itinerary. And so we come to the end of our excursion today. What can I add to the respect, with respect to our Holy Land experience? Firstly, I would emphasize that there's nothing like being on the ground. As I've tried to indicate, it's one thing to read about an event in Scripture and quite another to experience the location where that event occurred. There's no substitute for wading into the Jordan or walking down the Mount of Olives or gazing out across the Sea of Galilee from the Mount of Beatitudes at sunrise, as this photo shows. Jesus was there, and so are you. And this leads to a second and related point. A pilgrimage to the Holy Land emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. This is especially true of the places where we know with some precision that Jesus was physically present ancient Capernaum, for example, or the Temple Mount, or the Garden of Gethsemane. And even in the Jordan River, where the precise location of his baptism is less certain, the story itself recalls Jesus as a person with everything that that entails. To make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land is to meet the human Jesus. And finally, I would say that a visit to the Holy Land is vexing. And in some ways, it produces contradictory emotions. On the one hand, you have the thrill of visiting sites that are absolutely central to Christians, both spiritually and culturally. And at the same time, you turn in another direction and despair at the sight of the Hephrata wall topped with razor wire separating Jerusalem from the West Bank, as a previous slide just showed. Jews, Christians, and Muslims live side by side in the densely packed old city as they have for centuries, yet there's not much sense of harmony, despite the common heritage. So much beauty, so much history, so much faith, and yet so little love. And still we pilgrims come. Let me leave you with some of the resources that helped us prepare for our Holy Land pilgrimage. I won't go through each of these, but in addition to the Gospels, I would highlight Simon Montefiore's Jerusalem, the biography for an excellent history of Jerusalem from antiquity to today, and also James Martin's Jesus, a pilgrimage. A Jesuit priest, Father Martin relates his own pilgrimage experience in the Holy Land, visiting many of the sites that we did with powerful insights trying to decipher the Jesus who is both historical and spiritual, both human and divine. I'm sure that there are many other resources upon which you could draw, but the point that I would emphasize is that if you're planning a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, do some homework first. You'll be rewarded many times over. And finally, I want to give a shout out to St. George's College in Jerusalem. They're exceptionally well set up to lead pilgrimages. And as I said earlier, you don't have to be part of some larger group to sign up for one of their offerings. And I especially want to commend their course director, the Reverend Canon Mary June Nestler, who leads most of these pilgrimages. Mary June is just amazing. She's an ordained Episcopal priest, a biblical scholar, and an archeologist, having participated in Holy Land digs for decades. She's fluent in Hebrew and Arabic, and her English is pretty good too. And if you go to YouTube and search for St. George's, they're now offering a series of virtual pilgrimages on video during this time of pandemic, which you might enjoy watching. So I hope you have enjoyed the excursion today and thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Ken. That uh, is absolutely wonderful. And um, it's, uh, you know, the second time I've heard this now, and it's just uh, that much uh, deeper for me. Um, I've never been to the Holy Land, and uh, um, I feel, you know, they, they say that if you do go, you can certainly get a much better understanding of, uh, of Scripture, and especially 
of uh, of the places uh, that are appear so prominently in the Gospels. But even without setting foot in the Holy Land, I feel like I have, and thanks to your great leadership, I, I get a, a, a much better understanding of those uh, of those places that we read about in in Scripture. So uh, my thanks to you for um, for the care and uh, the clarity um, that you present this in such a engaging fashion that um, I know makes me want to go to the Holy Land and see it for myself. But uh, in the meantime, I will. Uh, I will feel good about uh, having this uh, uh, this background that you've provided. So thank you very much, Kent. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for those kind words. It's a it's an amazing place to visit. It really is, and um, it it really does help if you go with not necessarily a group, but you go with someone who can help you in that pilgrimage journey and. Um, I felt like the staff at St. George's um, just did an excellent job. Of course, they do this year, you know, day in and day out. Um, but there's there's really no substitute for being with someone that's gifted in helping you understand what you're seeing and giving you things to reflect upon while you're there. Um, and St. George's just did a just did a wonderful job. Their, their accommodations are a little Spartan. <laughs> it's a little bit by, like being in college again uh, kind of at a state college uh again uh but uh but their staff is wonderful and um uh, and you have to um you have to be flexible when you go to the holy land because there's uh, things change every day things that are supposed to be open you know in the afternoon they closed early for some reason logistically it's a challenge so you know the, the the itinerary that we followed was was pretty much driven by if we're in galilee we got to see these places even though they're not in the right order for example so you're seeing the annunciation you're seeing the ministry you're seeing the resurrection all on the same day and then you go somewhere else and you do something so it's only kind of after that you sit back and reflect on that and put it kind of in sequence that um that 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 helps you get the impact of what you just what you just saw but you don't have that luxury when you're there because logistically you have to see things in the order that it makes sense to 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 see them yeah yeah if that makes I, sense i love the way you you organized it not only geographically from you know, north to south and then to Jerusalem, but also the way it it um, attract Jesus's life as as well. So that was a, a wonderful way to organize this whole presentation. I thank you. Um, and, and I would add that Mike Bullington, who's uh, there in the lower left corner, uh, was also on the pilgrimage trip with us and uh, with his wife Robin. So Mike, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and and add to anything that um, uh, from your own experience. Well, I would just add, first of all, Kent, I'm not surprised you did a wonderful, I've not seen Kent's uh, presentation before, but I was, it was truly spectacular. Uh, and it was not a surprise to me because Kent, uh, this is a, a sort of a, a project of love for Kent to put this together, as well as the book that uh, Father Robin uh, referenced that's in the library there in Santa Fe. Uh, I commend it to you. To, to look through because you'll see a lot of the uh, pictures that Kent took that that were on the cutting floor, as he as he mentioned. Um, I don't really have anything to add. I think the uh, the, the highlights, the things that sent chills uh, up and down my spine, you've hit all of them. Uh, as Robin and I were sitting here watching uh, the presentation, we we were remembering the different places that uh, were depicted in the pictures and. And I would just echo uh, Kent's uh, uh, sort of charge that it is a wonderful place. And if you had the opportunity to go, by all means, I think you'll be very happy that you had that experience. Yeah. Anita, um, if you could go to your share screen and stop it. Um, somehow we've got your... Uh, your screen up, and I'm not sure how. Uh, uh, let me see. Maybe I can do stop this. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, yeah. 
maybe I'll just do this and see how that happens. Right. Uh, yeah, we're not sure why. Hmm. In any case, um, Kent, could you try stop sharing your screen and see what happens? Oh, okay. Am I still? Um... Oh wait, I uh, I can do this, and then I can do this. I think. Sorry, and then I'm going to stop sharing. Here we go. There. There we go. I, I'm not the best at uh, at Zoom, but that was uh, that was interesting. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you. So I just wanted to thank you for doing this a second time. I went to the Holy Land 35 years ago, so this presentation brought back a lot of memories for me, but also it was so well organized, and I love the way that you structured it and and were able to give your personal reflections on it. It was very meaningful, and I appreciated it a lot. Well, thank you, Anita. It's as I said, it's a wonderful place to visit. And um, uh, and I was telling Father Robin before all of you uh, joined us on the screen uh, this afternoon that even within the last few days, I've reflected on some things that hadn't occurred to me before that I'm still processing or contemplating from that pilgrimage experience. So it just it just shows that. The pilgrimage doesn't end when you come home. You know the the reflections afterward uh, is a continuation of that of that journey that you're still on. It certainly enriches our prayer life yeah. just to have those concrete images. At least that was my experience. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I was going to ask if there are are questions that we can uh, that Kent might be able to answer. Therese, you have one. Yeah. Um... Tell us a little more about the interaction between all these different groups of Christians, especially the Eastern and the Western. I'm curious well, what you observed. Yeah, we we um, uh, we picked up a, a little bit on that, uh, and I'm I'm not as well versed on 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 uh, the the details um, as I am on some of these other things. But for example, Holy Sepulchre, as I understand it. It's a, I mean, it's a huge complex. It, uh, as I said, you, you could walk by it in the, in the old city and you wouldn't even know that it's there. And you walk in and it's like, you know, the Astrodome. Uh, mm -hmm. And it had, there are, it has all these little kind of adjunct chapels and monasteries that are kind of attached to it. Um, and I think there are half a dozen different Christian um faith traditions that have some say over how Holy Sepulchre is run. So there's a Greek Orthodox, there's the, the, the Catholic, uh, the Copts, the uh, Ethiopians, which I don't think are the same as the Copts, even though they're, you know, both up there in Northeast Africa, um, uh, the Armenians, uh, and they all have, so there's, it was only, I want to say, in the maybe the 60s that they formed this kind of steering committee that was responsible for the overall running of Holy Sepulchre, you know, the maintenance and the, the, the hours that it's opened and this and that. And so, there, and, and as I understand it, I was just reading something the other day, there seems to be, you know, occasionally little turf wars about, you know, someone encroaching on the Ethiopian space that they, that they resent. So there's, there's a little bit of tension, uh, I think, among the different faith communities, uh, especially with respect to these kind of major, major shared sites, I, I guess I should say, if you go to if you go to a site that's run by the Franciscans, you know they've got pretty much control over that. But Sepulchre is kind of a is, is kind of a you know common to all the different faith traditions. Um, although I, I was reminded in reading something today, they they th there's this kind of ceremony. It's almost like the changing of the guards at Buckingham Palace, or you know they, there's a ceremony for closing up Holy Sepulchre at at eight o'clock in the evening. And they open it up at four o'clock in the morning, and there is a an Arab family. 
this is kind of incredible. There's an Arab family that has responsibility for opening up and closing it down. And they've had that responsibility for like 1300 years. I mean, it's been passed down through the family. It's the same family. And the key that they use to lock and unlock the, you know, it's like a foot long. And there's this whole ceremony about, you know, going and closing it up and then going at four o'clock in the morning and opening it up. So despite whatever, you know, friction there might be between the, the various sects with respect to the running of it, it still has these kind of wonderful little traditions that you would only find in a place like Jerusalem. And I understand that uh, on certain days, you can actually be locked in. It's kind of like a sleepover, you know, you can, you can, and I don't know if you have to um, uh, reserve a spot or, or, or what, but you get locked in and you're not getting out until four o'clock in the, you know, the next morning. You know, the, the thing that's more noticeable is kind of the relationship between Christians, Muslims, and Jews in particular. Um, and, you know, uh, Mike, feel free to jump in and share any of your recollections from that. But there, there were several times that, you know, we witnessed how this kind of, how this kind of friction played out. And, uh, you know, one that stands, uh, that, 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 that particularly stands out is um, when we got ready to do the Stations of the Cross. And uh, St. George's is located only about half a mile, quarter of a mile north of the Damascus Gate. So it's very easy to walk down to the Damascus Gate and enter the old city from, from the St. George's location. And so this was seven o'clock in the morning. So, I mean, it, it wasn't terribly, terribly early, but it was way before Jerusalem wakes up. And we were walking down the sidewalk outside the old city through the, the East Jerusalem neighborhood, which is, uh, I, I think, largely uh, Arab. And, um, uh, and we were carrying that cross that you saw in the picture on our way to go do the Stations of the Cross. And somebody started giving Mary June, I mean, an earful. Uh, you remember that, Mike? I mean, this, this guy was... And, and I'm not sure he was entirely mentally there. And I don't, I'm not sure this was the first time that, you know, this had happened either, but he was starting to give Mary June an earful about, you know, bringing a group of Christians through his neighborhood at seven o'clock in the morning. And she was having none of it, you know, and she was giving as good as she was as getting. Uh, and when you want, when you do the stations of the cross, I mean, you're just these are just they're essentially plaques on the wall in alleyways in old Jerusalem. So there's a plaque there next to a stand of postcards, for example, you know, it, it, next in next to some shop. And you know, we got the hairy eyeball from some of the from some of the the, the shop vendors. Um, there, I remember another. Uh, the, and then the Temple Mount is a whole other subject. Uh, the Temple Mount is actually controlled by Islamic authorities. This was part of the deal after the 67 war, where that's when Israel got occupation of, of Jerusalem. Prior to the 1967 war, the old city was, was um, uh, not part of the state of Israel. And uh, as part of the deal following that war, um, uh, Israel allowed uh, an, an Islamic authority that's based in Amman, Jordan, to, to actually control the Temple Mount, control what happens there. Uh, so long as Israel, Israel provided the security, you know, the, the, the army, that, the guards and so forth, but the actual controlling of what you can do on the Temple Mount is, is controlled by uh, uh, the Muslims. And uh, in fact, there's kind of a famous um, line that is attributed to Moshe Dayan, the, the Israeli general from the 67 war, who, you know, in defending, you know, the concession of giving the Muslims control of the, of the Temple Mount, he said something to the effect of, well, we're not going to build the second temple again. Um, and so he just let them control it. So as so when you go on the Temple Mount, you're not allowed to pray as a Christian, for example. Uh, Jews are not allowed to hold any kind of, um, uh, you know, religious ceremony. In fact, there's one kind of funny incident when we were on the Temple Mount and 
Mary June was was describing where the location of the second temple might have been. I don't think anyone really knows for sure, but she was trying to trying to suggest that the temple, you know, the back wall of the temple mount was along this line. So she had us all line up, you know, in this line at the base of some stairs to illustrate where the second temple might have been. And man, this, this Muslim security guard came out of nowhere and started giving Mary June an earful about leading us in prayer because we were all lined up. He thought it was some religious act. Um, so, I mean, just, and we were only there for two weeks and, you know, those are two instances where, you know, we, you could witness this little bit of friction between um, um, uh, Muslims, Arabs, or Muslims, Jews, and, and, and Christians. And um, it's not, it's not oppressive. It's not overpowering. It's not like you feel like you're you know, under armed guard or, you know, it wouldn't be like going to North Korea, I imagine, uh, but it's there. And uh, even aside from these incidents, you can kind of feel a little bit of tension, not a, not a threat to your physical safety, but just this little bit of, you know, the way people walk past each other. And uh, mm -hmm. so that, that was, um, that was my experience. And I, I don't know, Mike, if, 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 if you had that same impression or not. No, you gave two really good uh, examples of what happened to us. There, were, there was tension in the air. Uh, it was almost a relief on some days that were especially hot where we had encountered uh, some of this tension to get back to St. George's College and take a shower and go to dinner and sort of process the day. Uh, I mean, I think we were fortunate to, to have uh, knowledgeable guides like Mary June who could speak the, the different languages that need to be spoken and sort of negotiate our way out of uh, some of these tight spots that we were in. But that made the, that made the whole pilgrimage a little more uh, fun and memorable, frankly. Yeah, and, and, and it's life, it's reality of, you know, it's the way life is lived in that part of the world. And, uh, and I certainly, I mean, I wouldn't hesitate to go back, uh, you know, from a standpoint of personal safety or anything like that, I would not hesitate to go back. Um, but, but there is that. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, Anita. Really terrible. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna I'll just ask you for other questions. Go ahead, Anita. Um, is there a large military, a very visible military presence? Because I was there in 84 and the military was everywhere. And especially on the road back to Tel Aviv to fly out I've not seen so much military, um, but even in the city, in the, the yeah. uh, old city, there was a lot of military at that time. Is that yeah. still very prevalent? Well, I, we certainly saw soldiers walking around with automatic weapons. Um, and certainly, I mean, the airport's a whole different thing. I mean, uh, one thing the Israelis have down pat is security. And man, going in and out of, of uh, Ben Gurion at, um, in uh, Tel Aviv, is uh, that's an or I mean that's a that's a very well controlled process. In fact, um, uh, Arabs who live on the West Bank are not allowed to fly in and out of Israel. So if an Arab wants to go visit their, you know, their uncle in Detroit, they've got to drive to Amman, Jordan, or cross the border into into Jordan and fly out of Jordan. They're not allowed to enter Israel to, for the purpose of flying in and out of the, of the region. Um, you know, I, I would say the military presence was, was there, but it was, I don't remember it being terribly oppressive or, or omnipotent or omnipresent, uh, um, but, but, but they were there. I do remember going through um, metal detectors and security to get into the whaling wall. The, the, the part of the Western wall of the, of the uh, Temple Mount, the famous wailing wall where you see images of Jews praying uh, up against the wall. Yeah, we certainly went through security to get into that area. And I'm sure we had went through security to get into the Temple Mount. I don't remember it particularly, but I'm sure that you, you don't just wander in. Yeah. Thank you. I put one question in the chat and it, it was struck when uh, you were showing the picture of um, Wadi Kelt, Quelt, Wadi however Kelt. you pronounce that. Um, 
just amazing photographs. Um, did, did, were you on a bus? Did you take a bus through the wadi and then get out on, on foot at some point to take those wonderful photographs? Or um, how, how, how did you maneuver that through that, uh, that canyon? Yeah, the, um, um, you, uh, you can take a bus to kind of a parking area. Um, uh, and you're driving through the wilderness. And I mean, it's as bleak as those pictures showed. I mean, there's not a, it's not like the desert in New Mexico where you still get pinion trees and, you know, cacti and so forth. I mean, there's not a blade of anything growing. Uh, it is completely barren. And I remember driving, we were in a bus and, and we came, so your descent, and that one of the biggest um, revelations to me was just this elevation difference. I mean, if those of you who have been to Denver, for example, and you know, you're coming down from Idaho Springs, you know, down the, down the mountains into, into Denver proper on, on, on I-70, uh, it's like that, only shorter. Um, I mean, it is just straight down in 20 miles, you're going 3,000 feet. And so we were going down uh, toward Jericho and we turned off and there are still Bedouins, uh, camps, you know, people living in tents, you know, tending their goats and stuff just off the, just off the highway. You know, we turned off the, the main road and went down this road and ended, we ended up in a parking lot where there is a trail uh, that, and it was probably quarter mile, half mile, Mike, I'm just thinking that, I mean, it, was, it wasn't a long walk, but it was a dusty walk and there's no shade or no, and, and we had people, um, you know, of all ages, uh, but certainly folks in their 70s uh, uh, on this trip. So it wasn't so arduous that they couldn't walk there, but, but it, was, it was a dusty walk to this viewpoint. And then you get to this, and you're just kind of walking through this you know, this dusty hill with nothing but brown hills around you. And then all of a sudden you get to the canyon and it's like, oh my word, look at, look at this. And uh, we sat there for, um, I don't know, probably 30 minutes and just kind of admired the view. And there were vendors there trying to sell us camel hair trinkets and this and that. And you can walk, actually walk down into, into uh, St. George's Monastery from that spot. And in fact, uh, James Martin in that uh, book, Jesus of Pilgrimage, describes his experience of, you know, he just got into a taxi. He's traveling with a buddy and they get into a taxi and the, the guy's taking him to Jericho and on the way he says, well, let's go. I want to show you Wadi Kelt. And they, they get up in this. It's pretty much the same place we were at, I'm sure. And then they actually walked down into the, into the canyon and across that little bridge to, to where the monastery was. And he described it as a, you know, the the hottest you know excursion he had ever he had ever been on so you can you can actually walk in there and and hike in there um, um that kind of reminds me of a funny story i'll share because mike is on the on the call we went to uh, masada uh, we got there a couple of days early and went to mas and and had had some extra touring around jerusalem and so forth and one of the one of the things we did was to go to masada because uh, Kaki and I had actually been to Jerusalem or been to Israel back in the in the 90s and then once visited it and I remembered it just being this spectacular place. So we drove we hired a private guide and had a car and we drove down to Masada. And it's just I, I it, it's like I guess it's, I've never been to Acoma Pueblo, but it must be like Acoma Pueblo. I mean, it's up on this uh, uh, mesa top, basically, and Herod built this palace up there that is kind of inaccessible because it's just on this on this mesa this butte and um uh anyway we got there about 12 o'clock one o'clock and we took a cable car it was a cable car that takes you up to the top of masada and we're walking around masada and it must have been 110 degrees i mean it was scorching hot really really hot and we kept joking to each other well gee there's there's nobody here. Isn't this great? We have the place to ourselves. Well, there was a reason that nobody was there. It would be like visiting Death Valley at noon. You know, no one goes there at noon. You go there in the morning or the evening. And we were there right in the middle of the day. And oh my word, it was, it was really warm. Um, but back to, to Wadi Kelt, you can actually walk down into that, into that canyon, but we didn't, we did a short walk, but we basically drove there. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Other questions? Hey, Ken, thanks a bunch for uh, advising me the ability to join up here. Uh, my only comment would be most impressive to me was starting uh, your uh, presentation in Nazareth uh, and uh, just how stark the humble beginnings of this incredible faith and where, where it yeah. began. And, 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 you know, when you went into detail of your suppositions about the life of a carpenter uh, in that day and time, and um, it certainly raises questions. I mean, I'm sure every Jewish boy got an education in the faith, but I don't see how he was a pro a prodigy scholar or any I don't know coming out of that small community. So it's a it truly is a, a recast or or you know adds a, a lens of reality to uh, you know his life and this faith faith tradition. Uh, it's it's amazing. You know I, I was uh, reading the uh, uh, Father Martin's book again uh, last week and. Um, he made the, the, the observation that had Jesus started his ministry, say, in Jerusalem, you know, he would have been kind of crushed under the weight of the, of the authorities there, as he eventually was, of course, during uh, Holy Week. Um, but because he was up in Galilee, I mean, it, it was almost like no one really, <laughs> no one really cared. He was kind of, you know, uh, out in the out in the countryside, and and he was given three years to you know launch this ministry, which might not have been possible had he tried to launch the ministry in uh, in Jerusalem. Got it. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kent, it's Jim, and I'll just say thank you for letting me participate in this. This was a, a marvelous experience, and a couple of observations occurred to me. One was. Uh, I don't think much about the fact that uh, this this faith that we have we share with other people, and you mentioned the Greek or Orthodox Coptic Christians, and it, it caused me to wonder a little how they experience that and uh, how how their culture and traditions bring them a different experience, perhaps, and and how it would be different than ours. Also, the uh, reference to the story of the Good Samaritan uh, man, you showed those pictures. That wasn't a Good Samaritan. That was a Great Samaritan. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. Also Samaritan. <laughs> I always looked at it through the eyes of a child and, you know, the street in Dallas that uh, yeah. they might have encountered that on that might be right in front of my house, not in some uh, desolate place like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you know, the uh, uh, you especially notice you talk about the different ways of expressing expressing, you know, veneration or, or worship um, it the, the it is such a huge difference between the Greek Orthodox. And I would say even, you know, what I could see of the Catholic tradition to say nothing of the, you know, the Protestant tradition, um, the use of icons, the use of decoration, I mean, and you either kind of like it or you don't I mean, you, Well, I think we've got for is just Other. it's just icons and kind of it's like a it's like a bobble you know bob, all these baubles almost like Christmas tree ornaments hanging down I mean it's but it's it's the way they express their express their faith uh, completely different than than you know the church I went I grew up in that's for sure I have to tell you this is one of the pictures that you had that was describing those baubles and I had the, the same impression of Christmas tree ornaments but one of them and uh, I had to get closer to the screen to talk myself out of this I thought it was an ornament from Texas A&M <laughs> the, the one at uh, the, you probably in, in Bethlehem you know one of those I think so. picture? yeah but I mean we you know we went to uh, several uh, uh, Greek Orthodox churches, a couple of monasteries, 
uh, but also the, when we were there uh, ahead of the pilgrimage proper with the with the Bullingtons, I remember going into a Greek Orthodox church, and just the whole the whole feel of it is 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 different, and yet it's you know it's the same. It's essentially the same faith. Well, Kent, again, our our thanks to you for doing this and uh, for making it so. Uh, really come alive for uh, for us and uh, I'm glad we have this recorded now and it will be um, saved for posterity and we will uh, figure a way to get it uh, up on the website or otherwise uh, disseminated so that uh, others can enjoy your insights and uh, and your wisdom and, uh, and and just your your wonderful presentation it's uh, it's a real joy to to have been part of this. Thank you well, very much. Thanks. I wish we could all be in the in the same room, but then we wouldn't be able to pull in these folks that are not in the, in Santa Fe. So I guess there's a silver lining in every cloud, huh? And maybe what we'll just have to do is plan on going a, a, to a pilgrimage to the Holy Land altogether, and that way we can <laughs> there you go be together once again and enjoy each other's company. Yeah. Our thanks to you, Kent, and uh, thank you for everyone who joined in and. Uh, uh, hope that we can reconnect uh, when times are better. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone. God bless everyone. Thank you. Bye.